So, like I said, we're going over the last of our three Excel modules. And this one is naturally the most complex of the bunch. There's a lot to go over in this one, but a fair bit of it is repeated information. And so the project for this week is a, a financial projection worksheet with what if analysis and, and a chart. And so we're going to go over some of the more advanced features of Excel, not the most advanced. There is some full on programming that you can do with this, but we're not going to go over that this week. Uh, in fact, I don't think I've ever been in a class that covered the Excel programming. That's going to be something if you want to learn about it, you'll have to do it on your own. And so for this week, I have created a very simple um, worksheet for us to use. Only one tab so far. And all it has is a heading, my name, and some dollar values entered here. I gave these each some uh, unique patterns so that we'll see how uh, charts and such vary. So we don't need to go over any of this. First thing it's asking us to do is to rotate some text. So we need text to rotate. And to do that, we're going to come here and we're going to enter some names for these dollar values. We will call these legal fees. Um, let's see. Utilities. Salaries and uh, other. And what it wants us to do is to select all of these. We're already here on the page layout, which I believe is where it is. Yes, we have orientation, but let's make sure that this is what Sam will want us to do. We type the text, click the alignment group in the home tab, okay wants us to access it a different way. Just know that this is another way you can get to uh, orientation. But under alignment, we click this bottom right button here and it brings this up. And we have this handy little half compass here for our orientation. And what I would like to do is have them pointing up. So it reads like this from bottom to top. And so we click OK and it'll automatically adjust our row heights to account for it. And I don't like that that's shoved out so far. So I'm going to adjust our column width to fit those a little bit more snug. Use the fill handle to create a series of month names. This one is new to me. So we have these blank spaces here. Let's just do Jan, Feb. We could just type it out manually, or we could take our fill handle over January. You don't have to put in February. It'll know that automatically. It sees Jan and it says, oh, that's a format for dates. Uh, so if you start doing the fill handle, or rather it's a format for months. So if you start dragging the fill handle over, it's going to know March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December. And once you've gotten to the end, I wonder, just out of curiosity, if I go over one more. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. It loops. So we stop at December. And it's just a nice little feature to uh, minimize some of the tedium. Again, I didn't know about that. Uh, you have a few options for how to use the fill handle. If you come over here to this after you have used the fill handle, you can view your options. We have fill series currently selected, but you can just copy the cells plane. Fill formatting, so you could copy themes and such over. Fill without formatting or we have fill months here. This varies depending on what kind of sequence you have going on, but we don't want to change this. So we'll just click away from it. Uh, 
Increase in column widths. We've already done this. To enter an indent row titles. This works pretty much the same as with uh, Microsoft Word. Once you've entered your uh, data, you have your increase and decrease indents right here. So if you need to do this for the SAM project, then you can just find them, home tab, right above the word alignment. But we're not gonna worry about that for now. What I am going to do, because this bothers me, is I'm going to merge and center these. I'm also going to merge and center my name. As I found out uh, earlier, you can't do two of these at a time for some reason. Um, It'll only keep the first entry if you try to do both of these. So we, we would end up losing the name here in uh, uh, row two. So next slide. To copy a range of cells to non-adjacent destination area. OK. Select the cell or range of cells to copy and then click the OK. Um, this is, again, very much like what you saw in Word. So you grab your range of cells that you might want, and you would come up here and click Copy. And then um, place your cursor on the cell for the top left most uh, cell you want, basically your starting point. It's always going to start top left, because you know that's like how we read. We read left to right, then top to bottom. And then you would come down here to paste, and you would select your paste option. We currently don't have anything because I didn't copy, so we're not going to. But again, it's exactly like Word, so it should be no trouble for you. To insert a row, you want to right-click the row heading, first of all. And let's just come here to... Uh, salaries, right click this, we have insert, and that will create a, a new row for us. And so let's give this a name. Uh, we'll call it inventory. It should rotate our text and auto fit it to the um, height of the row. And it does. And we're just going to give it, let's go, just throw in some numbers, 10, 15, 25, 40, 60, 80, 110, 50. I'm just throwing a random selection of numbers in here, uh, steadily increasing, because later we're going to be using a chart tool. And I want this to be a little bit distinct. 230, 350, 500, and 1,000. We have our fifth row of data. Enter numbers with format symbols. So when you are entering your um, numeric data, we've said before that you have to enter only numbers for it to be recognized as numbers, but that's not 100% true. You can enter commas, dots, and percent signs as well. These are common symbols for really any number type. And so I'm not going to show you this. You just see here that if you enter a percent, it's going to recognize it as a percent. If you place a dot, it'll recognize that you've made a decimal and comma separation, et cetera, et cetera. To enter projected monthly sales, you click the Home tab, enter the desired numbers, and select Cells. Select a cell and then click Auto Sum twice to create a sum in the selected cell. So 
It'll come here. We've done this already, but just as a refresher up here, auto sum, double click that, and it automatically gives us our sum of the um, legal fees row, which in our case is $7,800. to enter and format the system date. This is a nice handy feature. Um, you don't have to enter a static date. Instead, what you can do is select the cell where you want it, click here, and instead of browsing through all of our functions, we come through this little drop-down menu, select date and time, and we want to scroll down and find the function simply called now, and here it is. We click OK, and this has no inputs, so we just click OK again, and it will give us, well, I need to merge and center this. Merge and center, and it says it's March 3rd, 2021, 8.59 a.m. Well, it doesn't give us the a.m., but 859, and this will change as time passes because that now function is just constantly pulling the system time, which is whatever time your computer is currently reading. And so when it clicks over to nine o'clock, you'll see that this will now read nine. Oh, lost my cursor for a second. Now, we covered this very briefly in the SAM project. I don't know why they didn't cover it in the first uh, Excel module. It's kind of aggravating, but it is what it is. Uh, about relative and absolute uh, references to cells. Um, you may have run into this problem in your first Excel project where it told you not to change the reference to the cell uh, and when you did the fill handle, it did change the reference and you ended up with some division by zero errors. Um, that is because in that cell that you were copying from, you had a reference like this, where you have dollar signs before the letter and the number. And in programming terms, a dollar sign generally refers to a constant value, something that you, you're not expected to change at any point. And that's how Excel handles it. And you can enter at these absolute values any way you want. If you leave the uh, dollar signs completely out, then that becomes a relative reference. And here you see this is a, uh, a column relative reference, and this is a row relative reference. To enter a formula containing an absolute cell reference, this is very, very simple and straightforward. Let's just come here and say that we want to enter, we want to know the last two months, the sum of them. We could say equals, uh, da, 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 da. I could just click it. Well, we have M6 here, but we can also press the F4 key to cycle between relative, and here's absolute, and now column relative and row relative. And if you press it a fourth time, it goes back to re fully relative. And so you have this option at your disposal if you want to have a number of different uh, calculations all pulling from the same cell, which is fairly common in spreadsheets and uh, calculating sales, especially if you enter a cell that includes you know, tax or some other interest percentage or something like that. To enter an if function, So we select our cell and we go to our enter formula button. 
And here we want to look for the set of logical functions. We have and, false, if, all these. We want if, just the simple uh, conditional function. And here is our set of inputs. Um, if you are taking or have taken programming courses or have looked at programming on your own, then this should be very familiar to you. So this is our condition. This is what would go in the, the code block if it evaluated to true. And here is what would go in the code block corresponding to the else statement. For those of you who aren't interested in programming or taking programming, you can kind of just put all that out of your head. Here's what you need to know. This is our what we want to check. So in our case, let's say we want to determine if n5 is greater than $10,000. And here it flat out tells us that's going to come out false. But we're going to say, uh, if it's true, then we need to put in a warning saying reduce cost. We're spending too much money on legal fees this year. We need to uh, take it down a notch. And if uh, we have less than 10,000, then we are fine. And once we've put in our conditions, there we go. And because we are less than 10,000, that evaluates to false and we are fine. But let's just say, for example, that December ended up being really high, $15,000 high. That will change this cell for us. I'll also throw an error because that's not big enough to uh, accommodate the space. But I'm not going to worry about changing that. I'm just going to undo it. And as you see, if this goes back to fine. Because it's always checking that condition. And to the remaining formulas for January, select the cell and press the down arrow key to enter the formulas. Da -de -da -de -da -da. Um, okay, this is just saying finish all these and now we can look at something else. So if you hold control and press the grave accent key, which is to the left of the one, it takes us into form into formula mode. And instead of seeing the outputs, we just see our inputs. And if we come up here, we see we have the now function. And because we haven't entered any formulas in places like this, we don't see anything. But let's go back to, let me find the key, back to this function here, or this mode. What I want to do now, just to finish out this chart, is I want to sum these rows, or these columns, rather. So we double click. Oh, I said we double click. Well, never mind. I'll just do it this way. No? What do you do? Oh. Uh, let's uh, cancel that. Let's try that again. Since we don't have, it's not the full row, we should just select the stuff and then do auto sum. There we go. This is 2135. And we can do the same here. And it'll give us, it's too big. Okay. Expand it out. There we go. And I just wanted to do two of these to show you that you can do these more than one at a time. For those who just need a little refresher. And there we have it. And now let's enter a uh, name for this one. We'll call this total. Oh, just to keep it a little more even, total cost. It's a little bit big, but 
I'd rather it be too big than too small. Um, speaking of that, there. Uh, and I'm going to leave that one alone on salaries. So we have our totals entered here. And I would like for the width of column B. Uh, yeah, this column here, uh, K, to be, to match, I want to fit everything, so, oh, come on. That should do it. Oh, I'm going to have to do this one at a time. Okay, that's fine. And last one, column D. I'm just double clicking each of these to force them to uh, shrink or grow to fit their uh, respective data. We're going to come back to this in a minute, I believe. Yes, to copy formulas with absolute cell references using the fill handle. Select the range to fill and then point to the fill handle. Oh, this is, yeah, this is the same thing that I talked about earlier. This is the, the problem that some of you ran into with, uh, or may have run into with the first Excel project is uh, copying with absolute references. The problem that was likely encountered is that you uh, entered the formula from scratch didn't realize there was already something there. I, I say this because I made that mistake while I was uh, practicing it to make sure that I knew what I was uh, talking about for section three. Determine row totals in non-adjacent cells. All right, we've done this a few times before, but if you have some cells that you want to find the totals for, whoops. Uh, some totals for, but they're not connected to each other. You can just control click to select non-adjacent cells. And now we can auto sum. And it's going to throw this at us again because we have text in the, uh, what is the output for this? Oh, okay. We have some uh, non-numeric data in, oh, come on. Let me just backspace and backspace. I ran into this problem here when I was practicing this too. So let's try, I forgot to hit control. Da, 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 da. All right, so now I believe we can auto sum and it should, yes, it places this Right, and we can expand this cell to fit it. And so that's how you would do that. But why would we want to do that? In this case, at least, when we can just do this. And then finally, we come here and fill this out. And there are our totals. And just for the sake of completeness, of course, we want to drag these around and then fit. There we go. We've completed our table. Doesn't take too long. I'm going to leave this cell here blank. It doesn't necessarily need a title. To add a spark line chart to the worksheet, we want to select the cell in which you want to insert a spark line chart. So, is we come here, we'll use this cell here. Let's make this a bit more square, just a tiny bit more. It feels a little, or a bit wider rather. It feels a little tall, to, or yeah, tall to me for its width. So, want to display the insert tab and click the line button to display the create spark lines dialog box. Oh, insert. 
And I tripped up and selected this because I thought this is what it meant with the line button. And I didn't see over here. We have this. It'll bring up this handy dialog box. We are on this line here. We want to get our monthly figures here and we want to display them in P5. So we're good to go. And it displays that. Uh, we can format this. We have a few style options. Let's go with a darker line than what we have. And we can change it to columns if we want. It displays nicely like that. This little single cell chart. I want it to use a relative reference. I don't want to use absolutes. Whoops. I want to use just P. No, I could just do this. <laughs> And we click OK. And we grab our fill handle, and just like always, we do this. And you see each one of these has a different shape to it. Um, and that is because it's pulling from a different data. And this is just showing everything that I showed you. Sparkline style and copy the charts. Change the sparkline type. Already got that. Assigning formats to non-adjacent ranges. We want to, this is the same thing as before. You just uh, use control to select things that aren't connected to each other. You can click and drag to select multiple groups, or you can just hold control and press click once and you'll select a single thing. And, uh, then you can apply whatever style or format you want. Formatting worksheet titles. Press Control Home to select a cell and then click the column heading to select the column. And this is all just the same things you are used to. So I'm not going to uh, go too deep into detail. Just know that if you want to go back to cell A1, all you have to do is hold control and press the home key, which is going to be located in the group of six above your arrow keys. Uh, assuming you're using a desktop keyboard, if you're using a laptop keyboard, uh, it may be up next to, on the same row as your function keys, your F1 through F12. So just uh, figure out where it is. Uh, it varies by design. Assigning cell styles to non-adjacent rows, same stuff as before. You use control click or control click and drag. Select the thing. Or you can do things a little bit different. So let's say we have this here. We want this to have a different format. We'll call the this here. Week. No, hold on. I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> I apologize. So instead, what I mean to do is come over here to fill color, and we have our options. Let's go with this uh, light faded blue here. And now we have selected that. And let's say we want to... The same for January. Oh, we don't have to go and look for the color. We just click, and it uses the last one that we had. We can do the same thing for all of these. Select them and click. And let's go ahead and fill out the styles for the rest of these. We want to give this the input style. Where is input? There it is, input. And now for these, we come down here. Click and control, click and drag. And we want this to be our output. Let me click here and this right. We're going to leave these on the far left as they are. 
So just a, a neat little uh, trick to speed up your formatting is that it will try to remember the last thing you used in some cases. Copy cell formatting using the Format Painter. This works very similar, but not quite identical. So what we want to do is, let's say we want to copy the output style to uh, these little true-false statements here. What we want to do is we want to select that, go to the Format Painter button, and double-click it, and you'll get this little cross icon. You can click them one at a time. Wait a minute. Uh, I thought I remembered how to do that. Let me refer to the directions. Select the source cell for the format to paint. Double click the format painter button on the home tab. And then move the pointer over to the worksheet. Cause the pointer to change to a double plus sign with a paintbrush. I may not have clicked it or double clicked it quite right. So we have that is our selected cell. Let me just try single clicking it. Okay. I don't know why it says to double click it because apparently that doesn't work. And now the difference with Word and Excel is that Excel doesn't drop you out immediately. It did drop me out immediately. It wasn't doing this before. <sighs> okay. Okay, now I double click it and it works. All right, there we go. I guess I wasn't double clicking it the way it wanted me to double click it. So you could do these one at a time and you notice it doesn't drop me out of the format painter. You can also drag it over and get the same effect. Now let's fill that one out. And then you can press the escape key or click Format Painter again to exit. And now all of our outputs have been formatted. I apologize that that turned into a stumbly mess. Uh, to format the what if assumption table, we select a cell, change fonts to blah, 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 blah. Um, this is just more on formatting. Not going to go into detail on that. Now, quickly, I need a drink of water. Does anybody have any questions so far? Nope. All righty. So, to draw a clustered column chart on a separate chart sheet using the recommended chart features. So, what we want to do? Select a range to identify the range of uh, categories. Hold control and select a data range. Like the recommended charts button on the insert tab to display the insert chart dialog box. All right, so come here and let's select, whoops. We only want to do January through December, and let's also do these. And now we also want to select our data. Let's select these separately, just to be sure. Follow the uh, PowerPoint instructions. Excuse me for a second. We go to Recommended Charts. And it's going to scream at us and say, I don't know what to do. All right, cool. Instead of that, we'll select these and then this. Let's go the other way around and only select on one axis here. Oh, recommended charts again, and it's going to tell us hey, we should use this. And boy, that's messy. Uh, we're going to adjust the formatting later. But for now, we're going to go with the selection it gives us. We're going to double click and our very flat chart appears here. We're here on the formatting. We want to move this to its own sheet and we're going to call it 
monthly expenses. Sure, my spelling is correct. And press enter. And we have our chart here on its own tab. Inserting a chart title. We did this already, but I'll just do it again. Click to select, click again. I press control A to select all this and we'll give it the same name as the tab itself. Monthly expenses. And when you're done, you just click off of the title and you're good to go. Adding data labels to click the chart elements button to display the chart elements gallery. We come here, we have add chart elements and we're looking for data labels. Come here and let's center these. Excuse me one second, I apologize for this. Oh. I have to keep my phone on so I can hear my alarm when I'm going over time. So I apologize for that. So here it's displaying all the numbers that we have. And as you can see, it's really clustered together and doesn't look good. To apply chart filters, now we're going to fix the problem. So this here is our series two. So what we want to do is click on the chart and here is our filters and we want to remove series two. So we uncheck that box by clicking on it and we click apply. And now we have a much more readable, but still a bit chaotic chart. No big deal. We'll just live with this. And when we're done, we just click off of the uh, filter flyout menu. Add axis titles. Again, this is going to be through the chart elements menu. We want to add our chart elements up here. Second option, axis title. We want a primary horizontal. And we are going to, oops. Oh, so we're just gonna call this months and click away. I'm going to repeat the process, but this time we want a primary vertical. And we're going to call this costs. Again, just click away. To change the chart style, we've done this before. Here we go again. You just click a style that we want out of the chart styles gallery. If you want more, then here's more. A few more, not very many. And once you're done, there you go. To modify the chart axis number format, we right click any value on the vertical axis, axis to display the shortcut menu. So it's talking about these here. So let's just click the 1200. I said, let's just click 1200. Why? Oh, duh. <laughs> okay, now we have format axis. I don't know why my mind was thinking it should start, um, it should do this automatically. No. So we see that our lowest value is $10, but our chart starts at zero. Let's change that formatting. All I want to do is change that to a 10 and that's it. Press enter and then that. And now we see our very bottom thing here says $10 instead of being effectively blank. Removing filters and data labels. 
And then this is the same process as before. We go to the uh, table elements, and we want to get rid of those labels because they're kind of a mess. And so now we're just back to having plain old lines. Rename and color sheet tabs. We've already done this, so I'm not going to go over it again. To reorder sheet tabs, we haven't done this, but it's incredibly simple. So I don't want my table to come before the data it's pulling from. So I want to click and drag sheets over here. And now it's where it should be. Very simple, just to click and drag, put it where you want it. Check spelling of multiple sheets. I didn't know you could do this. Let's come back up here. We're going to select cell A1, just to put us at the beginning, and come down here, control, and click on the other tabs you want to do. And then we come here and check our spelling. We have no errors. Now I want to... Come on, there we go. Just so we don't have both of them selected and that might throw something off. Preview and print, not going to do that. To shrink and magnify the view of the worksheet or chart, we have two options for that. You can come here to the bottom right, we have this handy slider. You can click zoom in or zoom out. It's currently at 100%. And this is where I like to leave it. It's perfectly fine as it is. But you have other options. Come over here to the View tab, and there is a Zoom button, which allows you to select or enter a custom amount. And when you're done, you would click OK. All right, not much more left to go here. To split a window into panes, this is again on the View tab. First thing we want to do is select a point on our table that we want to serve as the intersection. Where do these meet up? Uh, so we search for the option to split, which is right up here, the small button here. And it will split us into four panes, the origin of the uh, Split is the top left of whatever cell you selected. So we have separated our inputs uh, from our outputs, sort of. Remove the split by doing this, and let's just say we want to do it here. This would be a, probably a better place to do it because you've got your um, monthly totals, your yearly totals, and your complete total here. And it's all nicely organized into these panes. Let's just go ahead and turn that off because we don't have any need for it right now. It's just a handy thing to know. We also have an option to freeze worksheet columns and rows. Let's say we want to freeze our outputs, all of them. Select them. And you noticed here next to split and hide, we have freeze. We click this and we select freeze. And I am not entirely sure what this does. Uh, feel free to look it up, uh, Google it on your own time. I guess maybe it holds, it doesn't you know, allow for changes to come through. Let's see if there's something in the tooltip. Freeze a portion of the sheet to keep it visible where you scroll through the rest of the sheet. And for checking data and other, okay. So let's see what happens if we, oh, that's nice. If we're scrolling down, this sticks around. I don't personally see myself ever using that, but hey, it's handy. And once we're done with it, we can just click unfreeze. And of course we have a slide on unfreezing. Analyze data in worksheet by changing values. Obviously, if, as you change values in your worksheet, the uh, 
outputs are going to be modified. I don't want to go into too much detail on the, this because it's not giving us any explicit steps and these little blurbs are hard to read. So we're just going to move on. To goal seek. If you know the result you want a formula to produce, you can use goal seeking to determine the value of a cell on which the formula depends. We'll find this in the data tab. Goal seeking assumes you can change the value of only one cell. I am sorry for this. I'm getting hit with robocalls left and right. Let me start that over for you guys. Goal seeking assumes that you can change the value of only one cell referen referenced directly or indirectly to reach a specific goal for a value in another cell. Okay, so let's say we want our total expenses to be below $100,000 and we want to try and do this by only changing one cell. I don't think that's possible. Let's go with something a bit more reasonable and say 130,000. And so we come into the data tab here and we want to come to the right. I believe it is farther. What if analysis? Come here and our second option is goal seek. That brings up this dialog box. We're looking at N10, which is our final total. We want it to be 13 or 130? 130. 130,000. We want to do this by changing one cell. We'll say N9. And we click OK. And what's it saying? Cell must contain a value. OK, it has to be something with a, uh, a value just inserted. So it would be one of our inputs. And let's pick something. Let's say cell M. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, M6. And it found us a value to change it to. And let's uh, click OK. And we see that M6 has been changed to 46,315 from uh, 51,200. And now our cost total has reduced to 130,000. Using Smart Lookup Insight, this is exactly as it was in Word. You want to go to the Review tab and select Smart Lookup. Let's see how it differs between the pa the PowerPoint and our version. It does not uh, differ at all, and it'll bring this up here. You can enter your search term and find what you need. Here, this is talking about accessibility features. Uh, this is, I believe, also on the review tab. I'm going to check it again. Check accessibility right here. And so that's all that it wants us to talk about. I'm not going to show you guys this again. We've done it before uh, in Word. So it's going to be the same setup. 